The title of the message this morning is, How Big Is Your God? It's from the book of Job. And so, uh, as a pastor and as a doctor, I've been fielding many questions, everything from medical questions about the virus to deep theological questions about evil and the power of the devil on this earth. What I want to do this morning is answer all of your questions by not answering all of your questions. Yes, you heard me correctly. I want to answer all of the questions we might have or be able to come up with in this time by not answering the questions. There's one thing I'm sure we can all agree on right now, that the world is full of confusion. We also know that our God, 1 Corinthians 14, 33, our God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. So when it comes to what is happening in the world, there is not one part that's clear right now. No matter what you ask about what, what's going on with the virus or politics, uh, you can get many varied answers. I'm just going to mention a few. If you spend enough time on social media, you've probably seen something about this, a video or read something about this. But I know it seems funny on the surface, what I'm about to say. But what I want you to do is listen this time and just listen and think. Not, don't think funny. I want you to think what it means spiritually in the current state we're in in the world. So this is what we've been told or what we're being told. Don't leave your house unless you have to. Only be with the people you live with. Do not go to a church gathering, over nine people. But you can go to Walmart or a liquor store or a park. However, if too many people go to the park, then the park will be closed. Don't wear a mask because it seems like it doesn't help. But wait, do wear a mask if you want to. And now in some places you have to. But we're not sure if they help. And if you wear them inaccurately, it may actually be worse than not wearing them at all. But you definitely need one if you go to Menards. How about the food supply? The food supply is fine and there's no need to stock up, but... Randomly, there are shortages of chicken and sometimes beef. But remember, you don't need to stock up, but now you can only go to Woodman's once a week. How about as far as the virus? It seems it has very specific symptoms sometimes. But you can be sick and not have the symptoms, and you can have the symptoms and not have the virus. Nevertheless, we track how many people have the virus as though we know how many people have the virus, but the majority of the people who get the virus will never get sick and may have little or no symptoms. So it's likely that at least 50 times the number of people we say have the virus have actually had the virus. Many have probably had it, but we don't want to get it. But when we do get it, we might become immune and then we're fine unless maybe we can get it again. We think the virus remains active on all surfaces. At least in a laboratory environment it does. But we're not really sure how long. But now you can buy a UV light for your house to kill it. It also seems to be active in the air, but that may only be in a closed room with no breeze or wind. You're likely fine outside, but you can still wear a mask outside and stay six feet away from people. You're fine in your car if you're in a Walmart parking lot, but maybe we shouldn't allow churches to meet in their cars. But then the governor says it's okay, but in some states you'll get a fine because someone might open their window. But when you go to Walmart in your car, you can park right next to someone and open your window or get out of your car and walk in Walmart where it's virtually impossible to stay six feet from anyone. If you get the virus, there seems to be no real, true, effective treatment, except there is one that seems very safe unless it's dangerous. It may work very well. It may not work at all. In a new study, it seems as though it's not helpful. 
but for some people, it definitely saved their life. Seems as though animals may or may not be infected. Somehow there was a cat in Belgium that got infected before we were really testing. You can't pass the disease to dogs, they don't think. Animals, those kind of animals probably can't give it to humans, but somehow a few tigers get it and a couple of lions in a zoo. You can go to the store, you can stand in line, as long as the person in front of you is six feet away until you get to the cashier who will be pretty much right next to you and touch everything you touched and then take your money and give you some change that the last 50 people probably touched. And we cannot be sure it started in China, but at one point we seem pretty sure that an, in an unmonitored wet market, some guy ate a bat in a population of over a billion. Because there's no way it started in a lab just a few miles away from that market where they happened to be testing that virus. At least we're sure they didn't do it on purpose, unless they did, then we'll say it's their fault. But it's definitely the president's fault, unless you're a Republican, then it's the Democrats' fault, unless you're the New York Times, then it's evangelical Christians' fault, unless New York needs a hospital set up, then some Christians can come and do that until they leave, and then they're bad. How about as far as what we can and cannot do? It seems that's up to the federal government, so they give out guidelines. But then it, if your state has regulations, those seem to supersede the federal ones, but the president still goes on national TV, and I guess those are suggestions. It also depends on if your local authorities are going to enforce the regulations. Otherwise, just go by the federal ones, which start and stop at different dates than your state ones do. And we seem to know for sure that New York City has about 250,000 confirmed cases, but by recent antibody testing, it seems they have at least 2.5 million. So that makes it seem like maybe a lot of us have had it already, maybe in November or December, but the first case was probably in January, but now autopsies in California are showing that people died of it at least a month earlier. Summary. Confusion. Chaos, sickness, death, many questions. Everyone has an opinion, which leaves us all searching for answers. Surrounds us with others willing to add their own personal version of the truth for the discussion, which sounds a lot like the book of Job and Job's friends. In Job, we have confusion. Worse yet, many are confidently confused at times. Very, very close to the truth at most times, with Satan behind it all. And we see that without clear, theological, big, God-focused, firm, doctrinal truth, unshakable promises, without that as our foundation, chaos leads to utter confusion. You think it's ironic that we now live in a world where we are told over and over to live your own truth, that we can all have our own version of the truth. Everyone has their own truth. Look where that leads us in times of stress. Confused. No one knows what the truth is. However, there is one truth. There is one who is the truth. And without him, things spiral out of control. If there's one thing to see in all of this, it's that. So my prayer for us this morning in, in the word of God and through this message is that the word of God is what becomes alive in us in a way that answers many of our questions without having to answer all of our questions. May the Lord show us some big, awesome, powerful truths and reveal to us the bigness of our great God. I believe the truth of the word and some solid foundational doctrinal truths about who God is, when they settle in our hearts and our minds, they will crush any concerns we may have about the confusion and chaos and evil and deception and even conspiracy you see in what's happening. Church, if we swim in the confusion, our eyes will get blurred. Our hearts will be weakened. We'll begin to get sucked into these small things 
and take our eyes off the main thing. Because sometimes we forget our God is not small. This life is not long. We are not called to live for this world, especially in fear, especially in fear of things in this world, even those things that might take our life. Even in that, we are told clearly to fear not. I want you to know and to see that our God is so far above this confusion that we can also rise above it. Because we know the answers to the most important questions. When we experience trials and tribulations and we begin to complain or grumble or are filled with fear or hate or worry, it's because we're missing something or not believing something even. God is not worried. Confusion can reign on this earth and our God is king and he's on his throne. Maybe we've become too comfortable or complacent that these momentary afflictions have shaken some of us. I just want you to listen to these verses. In Acts 5, the followers of Jesus are arrested. The leaders want to kill them. They get beaten and they get released. Their response, Acts 5.41, they left the presence of the council rejoicing. Rejoicing they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Romans 5.3, rejoice in your suffering. 2 Corinthians 12.10, be content in persecution and calamity. Colossians 1.11, endure patiently with joy. Hebrews 10.34, joyfully accept plundering of your property even. And one you all know very well, James 1.2, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. I believe the writer of James would tell us to be doers of that word and not hearers only, that we would count it all joy. We've been in the book of Mark. We've been looking at the power and control of the all-encompassing providence of our Lord and God. So we remember Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That includes today. The King of Kings is still the King of Kings. Let us remember Ephesians 1, 21-23, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, that he is right now still far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one to come. He put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So we're told in Colossians 3, 1, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. So before we get into Job, I want you to hear this, young and old. I think almost all of our problems like doubt, apathy, boredom, lukewarmness, fear, anxiety, unhappiness, insecurity, come from a view of a God that is too small. The one true God, the God of the Bible, the one we know and love is the opposite of small. That was for my kids who are working on opposites. When times are good and easy, most people want a God. They want to believe in a God who is slightly bigger than us, slightly smarter than us. That is not true. And it does not work when things get hard. There's good news, though. Our God is infinitely big. He is shockingly powerful. He is unfathomably in control. I hope that humbles us and gives us peace. Solomon calls this the fear of God. He tells us that this kind of view of God is necessary for any proper relationship with God. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Any knowledge without 
fear of God is dangerous, potentially deceptive, without a trembling awe before the bigness of God, we'll never really know God or trust Him or walk with Him. We'll get sucked into the wind and the waves of this confusing world whose gods are tiny, super small. But they become very attractive. They're in our face, especially when we lower our eyes from God. This is what Job was faced with. Would he take his eyes off his big God? You can open up to Job 1. We're going to jump around. We're going to go super fast, but you can start Job 1.1. 1, 1. Job 1.1, 1, 1, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man, man was blameless and upright one who feared God and turned away from evil. So we don't know a ton about Job's background. He's said to be from us. We don't know exactly where that is. We don't know a ton about Job himself. I believe this is on purpose. So we don't get fixated on, s on small details, but instead let the big truth wash over some big issues for us. Suffering, sovereignty, evil, eternity. What told Job is blameless and upright, that he feared God and turned away from evil. We see he's faithful in his living. He's concerned about the spiritual welfare of his children, Job 1.5. When the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. Then look at this, for Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did this continuously. Job loved and was concerned for his kids, and, and Job was faithful and blameless and upright, and he was good and righteous. Then all of a sudden, next verse, Satan, meaning the accuser, Shows up in God's presence, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. The enemy basically shows up and says to God, jo Job is only following you for what you give him. If you let your people suffer, they'll give up. Because they don't truly want you, God, or trust you, God. They just want what you give them, he says. Take away their comfort and their earthly stuff and they'll grumble, they'll lose their joy, they'll become impatient and eventually, if you take away enough, they'll turn away from you. So God says, okay, attack Job. You can take everything in his life from him. Everything he loves, just don't kill him. So we'll see what he truly believes, if he truly loves me or just what I've given him. Church, what we see next says to us at, very, at the very least one thing. If we think we have it bad right now, this ain't nothing. Job experiences all-out attack. He loses his cattle. He loses his land. His kids, whose salvation he was just concerned about, are now dead. Job's response, verse 20 through 22 of Job 1. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. The Lord gave. The Lord had now taken away. And the Lord did no wrong. Worship the Lord. Blessed be his name. Then Satan comes along and attacks Job's health. He takes everything from Job. Now attacks his health. Interestingly doesn't take his wife. Probably because she makes it worse. She tells Job to turn away from God. Job is now sick, having lost almost everything. He's in pain, and she says, Job 2, 9. His wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? 
curse God and die. Job's response, verse 10, but he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. I'm pretty certain if you're like me that at this point you have some questions. Why in the world would God allow this? Especially to Job. He's such a nice guy. He's a faithful dude. If you're a parent, what about his kids? So we might expect Job is 42 chapters. He might spend the rest of the book providing us with the answers that we want to all of these questions. Surely these chapters to come will be the answers to the specific questions we think we need the answers to in order to understand God. Why Job? Why do bad things happen? That's not at all what we get. What we get is Job told by his wife to curse God, and then his friends show up. Eliphaz, Zophar, and Bildad. They come, it says, to comfort him, to sympathize with him. And then they go on and on and on and on, trying to comfort him with worldly wisdom mixed with the truth. They mix truth with the best of ancient wisdom. Much of it sounds pretty good. Like the kind of stuff you'd find in self-help books or false versions of Christianity on many blogs or in textbooks, counseling sessions, ancient religions, all over the world, throughout time, this is what people do. Take biblical truths, whether they know it or not, add their own flavor and cool sayings and try to fix things themselves or fix themselves or fix others with it. All the while worshiping small idols. Mostly for themselves. This is what people do because it's the most powerful tool of Satan. Deception. Confusion. Sounds good. Looks good. It's believable. But leads to sin and death. And makes God small and us big. So these friends are willing to sit with him. To try to comfort him. They are not bad guys. Their spirituality or ideas are not super far off from the truth. They think they have the answers Job needs. If only he would just hear and believe their truth. Basically they say to Job, we agree there's a God. That God is just. We know everything happens for a reason. The universe is fair. So the fact that you are suffering, Job, means there's a reason God's doing this to you. So make it all about you, Job. You just need to see what you did. And you need to change that. We get what sounds like biblical truth changed just a little pretty much sums up every other way of thinking in the world, including many false gospels. But Job pushes back. He says, that's not true. It's not about me. It's not because of me. There must be something bigger happening here. They push harder. Look, man, there has to be something. It has to be about you. Just keep looking. Think harder. Here's another saying. Try this one. Try this worldly truth. You're on a journey, Job. Just keep searching. Eventually, you'll have your moment of enlightenment. Find your path, Job. Then you'll get your answers. This goes on for about 35 chapters. They say things that are true-ish. But ultimately confusing. Eventually they leave. And so Job sits there. He's still searching, wondering, wanting an answer. Knowing it's bigger than just for himself and in himself. All of the... You might ask, I've been asking this actually for the last few days. Why 35 chapters? Why is Job 42 chapters? Because all of the powerless and weak 
wisdom of the world has now been applied and the questions remain. This is not new. The news, social media influencers, every worldly wise person and secular university, every famous so-called preacher, every politician, all of politics and entertainment, all of music and advertising, all has the same approach. Trying to tell us the same version, different versions of the same story. The world is filled with truths that are simply glimpses of the truth, made into our image. Sometimes we hear good things in them. But when we don't see the superficiality of it, it is powerfully deceptive and addicting. When we know this, however, we are now equipped to live in this world, which is basically us living in a tidal wave of the false wisdom of Job's friends. You need to be asking of all the messages you let into your life, all the things you listen to or see or hear or even believe, is this the truth or a cleverly disguised deception? Where did it come from? Or do you see and know and believe the big and awesome truth about our big and awesome God? There are many Many, many answers to your questions. Which are not truly the answer. There's a living parable for this in our day. It's called the internet. So after all of this, we get to chapter 38 and now God shows up. He answers the question. He answers all questions but not in the way our little minds would expect in these moments. God shows up and starts to ask Job a bunch of questions to give Job the answer to his question. Over 60 questions he asks. God says things like, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Have you comprehended how big the earth is? Did you make the grass grow? Did you make the rain come? Does lightning strike wherever you tell it to? How about the flood? How about lions and ravens and mountain goats? Do you give them food or allow them to give birth? Do you tell them where they can live? Did you create time? When you look out and wait for your grain to grow or the ox to do your work, is your faith in them or the one who created them? Take the birds. Did you teach them how to fly? Do you know why ostriches have wings? It says that in there. God asks him really big questions and some seemingly small questions, and we should ask why. Because the answer to all questions is not first found by us analyzing the world from our point of view or our circumstances. That is not where the answers are found. Looking at the world that way will bring us many answers, very small answers. Because God's wisdom is not just kind of above ours. His ways are not just a little better than ours. We cannot fathom the answer to big things like, where should we put the stars in the sky? Which to God is a small thing. So to understand infinite goodness or infinite love or infinite justice we need an infinite perspective on the infinite truth so when we get to chapter 40 god says when you look at your circumstances do you think i did something wrong things around you are going wrong and god says do you think i messed up job 40 verse 2 shall a fault finder contend with the almighty He who argues with God, let him answer it. Hey, Job, do you and your super smart, enlightened friends, do you want to use your perspective on good and evil and right and wrong to run the world even for one day? Do you really want to be in charge? Do you know better? Do you want to punish every little wrong and injustice in every instance based on your definition of justice? Do you know how many different things are happening in the world at one time and how they are interconnected? We are so small. He is so infinite. 
The chapter, the book ends with God pointing us to heaven. He ends up restoring everything that Job sevenfold. But we never really get the specific answers we're looking for. The answers to all the questions we've come up with about evil and suffering and sovereignty and goodness. We don't get all of those answers, and neither did Job. He gets a better answer. We get a better answer. Foundational, big, powerful truths about a big, powerful, sovereign God. Who is the answer we need? God's answer to us in suffering and in the midst of confusion. Truth number one. God is sovereign, we are not. Truth number one we see here from the book of Job. God is sovereign, we are not. The most obvious and powerful truth Job hears from God in his questions is this. God has absolute power and control over creation and life and animals and stars and weather and disease and angels and even Satan. I hope you saw that. This probably brings up even more questions for you. Even Satan does nothing except by permission. Oh man, now do you have some questions? And in that, we see God has purposes in creation and in our lives that go so far beyond our ability to see or understand. The first answer we need to hear when we have questions and we don't understand is that God does. He understands. He's always in control. Isn't that the answer he gives Job in those questions? If you want to know why God is doing something, anything, start here. He is sovereign. He will get glory. Then you might ask, wait, I should be happy because God is using suffering for his glory. Yes. This is actually the truth that is foundational to all true happiness. He works all things for his glory, which is for your good if you love him. Truth number two, God's perspective is infinite. God's perspective is infinite and eternal. Ours is super small. God's perspective is infinite and eternal. Ours is super small. We can't even begin to understand the mystery behind natural things. How will we understand the eternal and spiritual without God? There's a problem. Philosophers call it the problem of evil. Listen to the question. If God is love and in total control, then how can this happen or that happen? If God is love and in total control, then how can evil happen? How can this happen or that happen? That is a hard question to answer because it's a bad question. The problem in answering the question is actually the question, not the answer. The question is, if God is love and if God is in total control, No matter what your first grade teacher told you, there are some bad questions. Because God is love. God is in total control. Start there. The question is, since God is love and in total control, how can this or that happen? God is big. God made at least 3,000 billion trillion stars. I dare all the scientists in the history of the world to make one star. Each star has enough energy to power trillions of atomic bombs every second. We are very small. We are powerless. And since his wisdom is higher than ours and his power is greater than ours, there will be some things, if not most things, beyond our ability to understand. Especially if we don't start with the truth. 
that God is way bigger and smarter than us. The amount of pride that goes into anyone thinking they found the truth on their own is staggering. And honestly, it's sadly deceptive. Because when we do that, we've made ourselves God. Truth number three, God's plans never fail. God's plans never fail. Ours do. Church, the government, politics, Hollywood, sin, evil, even Satan's attempts to stop God or even diminish God, they will always fail. There's great beauty in that. There's actually peace in that because we know that any attack on God or God's people will only further God's purposes. I'll say that again. Any attack on God or God's people will only further God's purposes. What do you think Satan had in mind when he came to God and said, hey, I'm going to prove something by attacking Job? What did he want to prove? What was his plan? And what was the end result? Glory, honor, power given to the Most High God. How about for Job? Job found joy. First in God, then from God. Job found peace and joy. He returned to God. He had returned to a view of God that was big before God restored all the stuff. And, and through the book of Job, many, 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 including us right now, have been encouraged by the enemy's failure to show God to be unworthy. And by the way, isn't this the gospel? Jesus on a cross, dead, his followers feeling defeated. It seems as though the enemy has won in those moments until three days later when he rises again in victory. Truth number four, God's promises are forever. God's promises are forever, not simply for this life. God's promises are forever, not simply for this life. In the middle of the book of Job, the, the, the Wi-Fi to show you the verses isn't working, so turn quickly to Job 19. Job 19, verse 25. I want you to see this verse. Truth number four, God's promises are forever, not simply for this life. In the middle of the book, Job is still trying to figure out what's going on. He's even crying out at times. He's getting all this wisdom from the world. In the midst of that, he grabs tight to a promise. How beautiful that this is in the middle of the book of Job. Job 19.25, this is so great. For I know my Redeemer lives. And at the last, at the end, at the last, he will stand upon the earth. Remember the verse I asked you to memorize a few weeks ago. Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Here Job holds on to a promise. He still does not have all the answers. But he knows his Redeemer lives, and at the end he will stand in victory on the earth. When we hold on to promises like that in the midst of confusion, then with Paul we can say what he says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17 and 18. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that we see or to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. The things that are seen are transient. The things that are unseen are eternal. For I know my Redeemer lives, and at the end he will stand on the earth. We see all these things happening around us and know they are nothing compared to the eternal glory of Jesus. Last point, number five, God is with us always. God is with us always. Notice what else is true in this promise Job holds on to. 
For I know my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. What did Job actually know when he said that? We know what it means. We have further revelation into what he's talking about. Remember last week? Jesus took our punishment. So no matter what we go through here, especially for him, we will not suffer for eternity. And he's alive and he is with us right now. This thing that is happening may be feel painful. You may be in pain. The virus itself is not good, but God is. And he is with us. Your Redeemer lives. And so in our earthly suffering, we have his presence. Job wanted answers. His friends' answers were numerous, but not sufficient. God gave Job the answer himself. As soon as Job saw who God was more clearly, only then was Job satisfied. And like I said, notice, Job is now satisfied even before he was fully restored. When Job saw the bigness of his God, Job was so busy repenting, he didn't have time for any more questions. We think we need explanations for everything, so then we can understand. And in doing that, we become like Job's friends. We think, God, if you would just explain it all to me, so then I could focus more clearly on you. What we really need is to understand that God is bigger than enough. So God is enough. Remember, Job started the book by saying, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Job knew this foundational truth at the beginning. So through the confusion, he could persist. He knew those other answers didn't explain what he already knew. So he ends with a conclusion. God is enough. God is enough. I don't need answers to all my specific questions. Because I have answers to the the true questions, the important questions. The book of Revelation ends with Jesus speaking and then John speaking. I want to show you something in it. The book of Revelation, at the very end, you get Jesus speaking. If you want to turn to Revelation 22, you can. You get Jesus speaking, then you get John speaking. Jesus says in verse 7, Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. John, verse twenty, or verse 8 and 9, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of an angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers and the prophets and those who keep the words of this book. You worship God. Verses 12 and 13, Jesus. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. John, verse 18 and 19. I want to warn, I warn everyone who hears the words of this prophecy, this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him plagues. Described in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of these book, the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share of the tree of life in the holy city, which are described in this book. So we get this bigness and this glory at the end. Hold on to the truth of God and who he is. Worship him. Start there. Interestingly, in the midst of all that bigness and glory, tells us what we're supposed to do. I don't know if you've caught this. The last chapter of the Bible, the Spirit and the Bride are there. 
the bride, the church. We have something to do, something to say. Revelation twenty two seventeen. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who desires to take the water of life without price. Times are confusing. Church, what are we supposed to do? Fear nothing but God. Rise above the confusion. Go to God for our answers. Like Job, repent and obey. Remember the gospel of grace. Our Redeemer lives. Pray for Jesus to come and then go and tell everyone, come to Jesus. The command there in Revelation is just come. Just come. God can and God will do the rest. Jeremiah 32, 27 says this. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Answer, no. You can get all the answers to all your questions, and ultimately that will mean nothing unless you know the one who is the answer to all questions. Do you know and trust and love God? Do you know the beauty of the gospel? Do you see God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ? If your answer to those questions is yes, only then will you get the true answer to any other question. Amen. Let me pray. Lord God, we love you. We thank you that you do not leave us in the wind and the waves. You do not want us to be confused. So help us to go to you for our answers, to know that you are so much better, so much bigger. Even as we just sang, Jesus, you are so much better than anything. Victory, suffering, anything. You're better. Lord, remind us daily that you are still have always been and always will be in full and total control. So if we start to worry or wonder or get confused, we can return to that beautiful truth, Lord. Help us as your church invite all to come, that they may know you the way we do, Lord. You give us the power to do this for the glory of your name. Amen.